Well, all right, all right, everybody. Welcome aboard. Welcome back. Another edition of Legend Sports Amplifier. We're going to be talking tonight with Andrew Nelson of uh, the North Star Nines. Let's get to vintage baseball. We're going to have a bunch of topics we're going to talk about tonight. How you doing, Andrew? Welcome. Good. How are you, Philip? I am doing good. I'm doing good. Uh, I know how it is. No worries. You know, uh, we're all, this is all our, our day. This isn't our day job, right? <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, uh, I'm a supervisor at my real job and I don't really have hours. So I have to kind of just be there when I have to be there. All right. <clears throat> well, uh, we are going to talk some vintage baseball and, 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 you know, I was thinking about this when we were, um, Anyway, I finally got you on here now. <laughs> when um, when I was thinking about this the other day where I was getting ready to, to talk about this, uh, you're like a brother from another mother, man. I was I was just telling you, I mean, I, I am a history guy. I'm a sports history guy. I, I love that time period, that 1860s to, you know, 1900 uh, in, in U.S. history, not just not just baseball history, but it's been fascinating. And you know, I think I don't know if you've been following along with some of the other guests I've had on here. I'm trying to get as many people on here to get as many perspectives. A lot of it has been the Negro Leagues. Um, I've had some guests on that have talked. Uh, Dr. James Brunson was talking about Negro League baseball going back to the uh, 1850s, 1860s. Some interesting stuff. So um, we're going to talk about vintage baseball. So if you want to tell us uh, a little bit about what got you into that? And I think it'd be kind of interesting to find out because I, I got a couple of little stories I'll tell you when you're done. Sure. So how I got into vintage baseball is uh, purely by coincidence. Um, I had a, I was living in Rochester, Minnesota at the time, and I had a coworker who knew I was a history buff and a baseball fan. And he said, oh, you know, there's these guys that play, you know, old style 19th century baseball at our local history center and they've got an event coming up and the event happened to be their 4th of July event at a place called Forestville State Park, which has a 19th century uh, town in it. And it's, you know, maybe a dozen buildings or, or so, but uh, they open up the buildings and they have a, a living history thing over the 4th of July. And so we were able to work a vintage baseball game into that. Um, and well, I shouldn't say we, I wasn't with them at the time, mm -hmm. but I went and saw the Roosters who, uh, that's the name of the local club that I'm part of, the uh, Roosters Baseball Club of Rochester. And um, I was hooked. So I went to a couple of practices at the end of their season that year. Uh, that was a couple of years ago. Um, played the f off and on the full season with them uh, in 2019. Only got a couple of games in last year because of covid obviously. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, we're, we've just recently started up now this summer. And uh, since things are a lot better, uh, everything's opened up. We don't have any restrictions. And it's, uh, it's, it's really nice. It's exciting to be out there on the, uh, on the diamond again. I bet. I mean, so how long, how long ago, what year was that when you, when you uh, first heard about it? So I first heard about them in 2018. Okay. Um, the club's been around for 25 years now. We're we're celebrating our, our 25th year. Um, cool. And uh, yeah, it's I. There's this whole world that I had no idea about until, no. I, got, until no. I got started. Uh, there, there's actually a lot of teams around. So. There sure are. And you know, uh, I moved to. I, I grew up in in the Northeast in Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. and um, you know, when I was a kid, there was there was a couple of teams. I, Christy Matheson is from Factoryville. And sure. there were, uh, you know, you drive into Factoryville. I remember even as a little kid when I was playing Little League in the 70s, uh, you drive in and it's just a home of Christy Matheson. And they have a, a, a ballpark set up and they would put on a, a uh, it wasn't this far back of a time period, but they yeah. would, every year they would put on a, a uh, it was more 1900s to 1910, Christy Matheson's era baseball mm -hmm. game. And it was, it was pretty, pretty fun. But then I moved down here to Texas and I was only here a couple of years. In 2004, Jim Booten, the who just passed away a couple of years ago, but yeah. for whatever reason, he got into vintage baseball. I don't know if you if you knew that, but he yeah. was a big, big supporter of it. And he came here in 2004 to the college, uh, Lone Star College, which is just north of Houston. 
Mm-hmm. And they did a whole, like you're talking about, a whole day of events and vintage baseball. And they had guests and they had, every, you know, it just was so much fun. So I went to it and I was yeah. like, are you kidding me? I mean, it was, it was like, it was way too much fun because it, it was, it was, great. it was theater and it was a little bit of baseball and everybody was, I mean, it, it just was a lot of fun. And, and, and uh, anybody who gets a chance to, to check it out in their area, they have to go check it out because uh, it, it's, it's not only fun. It, it's it's the roots of the game. I mean, it's, this is where it all started. And that's why I wanted to talk to you because one of the things that I have uh, been trying to, especially with the Negro Leagues, mm-hmm. uh, in a lot of the talks I've been having with guests, is make sure people understand that you cannot take 2021 or 2001 or 1991 or anything and equate it back to these time periods because yeah. it, it's not it, it's apples and oranges and and so like you know everybody wants to take this time period or they want to take the 1900 1903 or the negro leagues in 1920 and come up with a nice here's the standings here's the t- statistics here's the league leaders and and right. it, it really wasn't totally like that it, it evolved over time and and you know that's what i want to talk to you about and and get people to understand where the rules of the game started how you play and 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 this is what the game started as it was more a uh, i don't know i guess more of a club physical fitness kind of thing wasn't it back in the days sure. I mean, and and so it's not the same as it is you cannot take today's time period and, and equate it to these um uh, these types of, uh, of things. And I think people need to just wrap their heads around that. You know? Yeah. That's actually kind of one of my hobby horses is um, there's always some people who like to go on and on about the, the purity of the game and uh, think that any change is bad and wrong and uh, it is ruining baseball. And I can tell you that people have been saying that since the very beginning, probably. Probably, um, yeah. B- baseball has changed quite a lot over the last you know, 150 plus years. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and even with vintage baseball, there's a variety of rules. Um, the club that I play with, the Roosters, we play 1860 rule of baseball. Uh, so that's very, very early. Um, the first organized rules of baseball weren't really put down and distributed until 1858, 1859. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so there's 1860 clubs like us. There's 1860, uh, 1866, I think, clubs. Uh, 18, there's 1886 clubs for sure. Um, there's a competitive league of those out in the Bay Area of California. Um, and there are... 1874, I want to say they they coincide with major uh, revisions of the rules. So I know um, I mentioned to you, I think, in an email, a great book that I read was Game of Inches. That mm-hmm. it literally walks through step by step from 1845 all the way up to present day, all of the changes of the way the game has evolved. And I don't know how many people realize because I think you tend to take things for granted when you're living today. They, yeah. didn't, they didn't use gloves. <laughs> they didn't have a, you know, they didn't have a mound. I mean, you know, they used to call pitches. It was underhand. It was, it was, a, it was a different game. And, and yeah. um, you know, uh, it doesn't make it not baseball. It was baseball, but just right. like the way a musket is not, you know, a, a, a 155 millimeter howitzer, you know, right. that's, it doesn't mean it's not still a gun, right? I mean, it's right. some fashion, right? So, you know, that would be kind of fun if you can, I mean, uh, do you have, I know you sent me a bunch of links. Is there, mm-hmm. is, uh, and I found a couple of little uh, videos out there. There was one from a, a, a group up in Maine that's like a little three minute video that shows kind of a, of a vintage uh, uh, baseball game, 1860 rules, I think it was. But do you do you yeah. have one? Do you have any footage of, of you guys playing or your league or anything like that? Um, so I don't personally. Um, we unfortunately we're not set up super well to share things um, independently because it's all run off of the Facebook page. Mm-hmm. Um, 
but we do have a Facebook page, uh, Roosters Baseball Club of Rochester Baseball. It's two words. Um, okay, that I've got up. Yeah, I've got I've got that. I'll put that up in a in a bit. Um, I, I, did... I would say, kind of a good uh, tongue in cheek intro to um, vintage <laughs> baseball is Conan O'Brien did. Oh my God, that was... <laughs> somebody. Yeah, they posted that. What one of the guys on, on Twitter posted that? That is hysterical. Yeah. That yeah. Is, that is some I mean, you know, it stuff. doesn't go into detail so much, but it's not that far off of what it's <laughs> what it's like. Um, you know, it, it's you... kind of lighthearted. You can't take it too seriously. No. Uh, uh, although some people do. <laughs> I bet, right? Uh, but, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to play this one here. I, and I know I went out of that one website you sent me, the vintage baseball association. Yeah. Um, and, and that's got some videos on there that talks about umpiring and some other things, but there's not really, I, I wanted I wanted people to actually see, see, see this in, in action. Right. So I, I, I we could even sure. play the Conan O'Brien one, but that's about six minutes long. This one's only about yeah. three minutes long. So I'm going to, I'm going to play this video. Uh, okay. it's from, um, it's called Vintage Baseball. It's from uh, it's from Maine. It's a group from Maine, so you'll be able to take a look at it. And let's 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 see how it uh, how it plays on here. Whoops, wrong one. Uh, where are you? Okay, here we go. So I'm going to play this video. Let's see how it let's how it is. Zero! <laughs> they thought if only Casey could get a whack at that, we'd put up even money now with Casey at the back. It's very familiar symptom. Well, when this is all done, I'll let you know my dick pics. Okay. Look at that guy. <laughs> oh, the production is very nicely put together. It really is. That's why I, I looked at a few of these. This one, they did a nice job. And the umpire sends the right to. That's a trip. So that is one of the things that you'll notice attending a vintage baseball game is we do tend to be an older set. Look at, uh, look at these guys. He's smoking a cigarette out there. <laughs> I'm in my late 30s and I'm definitely one of the younger guys around. <laughs> oh, boy. Don't, don't let age or uh, seeming fitness fool you. These guys are, are pretty good athletes. I love the bat toss. This is awesome. Do you guys do this? Oh, I... No. <laughs> All right. What shall you do? You flip a rock? That was another way to do it. Our, our, uh, our fearless leader has an actual 1860 penny that he flips. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. They do a very nice uniform. This is all, you know, volunteer efforts and, yep. you know, club sort of things. So quality always varies quite a bit as far as oh, the sure. people are able to put together. And, These guys uh, got some nice duds on, don't they? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's the first time we had some uh, four out in the, in the field. All right. So, Tom, if you, were you on second going to third? He looks very so, vintage, yeah, doesn't he, with the guy with the beard? Look at him. <laughs> you give him a musket, he's ready to go... Uh... You know, the bull run or something. Right. <laughs> oh, that was cool. Cloud Hunter. Dorigo pounds them 14. Game well played. Three cheers, boys. Hit That's hit. another thing that uh, is very true of vintage baseball and 19th century baseball is you tended to have a lot higher scores. Um, you know, when, you, when you don't have gloves to catch a ball with, I mean, it, it's oh, fun. Yeah. And uh, errors were a lot more common. Yeah. There's a reason why you were able to get out on the first bound, too. 
Oh, he almost got the uh, other. It, it wasn't quite on first bounce there. They did do a nice job on that video. It was very, very nice. I have to oh, say. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I have to say. So, uh, so that is just a little clip so everybody can see what what uh, vintage baseball looks like. So, uh, you know, uh, boy, I uh, I have been into baseball simulations and, and mm -hmm. things like that for a long, long time. Going back, I don't know if you've heard of Stratomatic oh, yeah. uh, app, but those types of things. Now it's out of the park. And it gives you the ability to... Um, you know, basically, you could play any season from 1871. I even went back to 1858. I brought in guys like Jim Creighton, who I'm sure you're familiar nice. with, and 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 Dickie Pierce, and and uh, you know, guys who were playing whose careers were uh, pretty much either either was over. Like Harry Wright was 35 or something when 1871 rolled around. Mm -hmm. So it got those guys in in their prime, and then I rolled it forward, integrated from there. So it's a lot of fun, but. It, it it still puts it into you know a modern context, but it sure. wasn't it wasn't the way the game uh, was played. It was a lot more leisurely, and I think as time went on, it became uh, a lot more cutthroat. I mean, even in the 1880s and 90s, it became so rowdy. <laughs> They had to have more rule changes, right? But yeah. so you play 1860. What's the difference in the rules that that uh, I mean, you you, met, you named off three, four different variations. So yeah. what what what's the, some of the differences, or what do you play by that uh, uh, is in the league that you're in? Sure. So um, I mean, the first thing that most people will notice with a vintage baseball game is no gloves. Mm -hmm. you just have your bare hands to catch a ball with, and a big uh, driver behind one of the main rules differences because of that is that you could, if you get a ball on the first bound that counts as an out, just like if you caught it in the air. Mm -hmm. Um, another big difference between 1860 and later rules editions is there are no balls. So, uh, you know, if the pitcher, uh, isn't so accurate, <laughs> he, he, there's no such thing as a walk. Okay. Um, additionally, and related to that, there's no such thing as a, a as a bean ball. I mean, you can get bean, but you don't get a base for it. <laughs> of course, <laughs> so, they're not they're not throwing a you know ninety eight. So that's that that makes it a little less sting, I guess, right? <laughs> right, and that brings us to another uh, another key difference is that the pitching is all underhand. Uh, it is not from a mound. There there is a line that the pitcher is supposed to have um, at least one foot stay behind during the whole pitch. Um, there is the expectation that the pitcher will throw a hittable ball. Um, even though they didn't call balls, um, it, it was the expectation that it would be hittable. You know, it, mm -hmm. that's a wide, uh, a wide definition. You may have guys taking overhand chops at, uh, <laughs> at high pitches, but, uh, that's not at all unusual in a vintage mm -hmm. game. Um, yep. There is, uh, there's no infield fly rule. Um, anything that lands uh, fair at all is playable. So, um, you know, that's one of the play style differences you see is that, uh, I mean, even if you hit something right in front of you, if it's fair, you, you go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if you make contact you want to get going right away in a vintage baseball game because uh, what what's the fair foul rule? What what's what is that? So it's um, it has to land within the first and third line. Um, it's not really that different than okay um, than modern um, play. It's I, I thought I read. I remember reading somewhere. Uh, if it was foul, but then it comes back fair before it goes past first base, I, I didn't even know what that was all about. But it, so, so there's some way that a, a ball could be foul and then become fair, unlike today's rule where it could be it's, it's dead. But I, I, I don't know. You know, I, I don't. I haven't followed it too much. Yeah, um, that's entirely possible. There, there are a lot of like, if if a ball hits off something, that doesn't affect its playability at all. Mm -hmm. So like if um, we have uh, a fence that only goes about halfway across of our outfield uh, on our home field that we play at. And if a ball 
bounces off that fence, but you catch it, mm -hmm. that's an out. That counts as a bounce. <laughs> okay. So uh, sometimes it can be actually be counterproductive to be a, a power slugger in vintage baseball, um, both because a, a ball in the air can be easier to catch sometimes, mm -hmm. uh, or, or a fly that is easier to catch on the hop than a line drive that's hopping hard. Mm -hmm. um, I would think, right? I mean, you hit something hard on the ground. I mean, uh, boy, look, look at what's got to happen. First, somebody without a glove... <laughs> has to come up with that clean. Then yeah. they have to fire it across to first base. And he doesn't have a glove. <laughs> so, yeah, the, the, I would think your chances of getting on and just put it on the ground somewhere uh, would be Yeah, a bit it's better. definitely um, – it, it's a game of movement much more than, you know, 2021 baseball is, mm -hmm. um, you know, even more than – the baseball that I grew up on in, in the eighties and nineties, where you still had guys like Ricky Henderson, mm -hmm. uh, running a lot. Um, it's really about contact and movement. And, um, can you steal, can you steal, can you steal? You can steal. We, we don't usually just out of, uh, friendliness and sportsmanship uh -oh. in, in our games. Um, cause you really, you need to be pretty hardcore to be able to to feel those throws from like home plate, and you need to have a catcher who can get that ball out quickly. Um, which it, you know, some of our guys, you know, we have guys who played college ball, we have guys who played low level minors, you know, like once upon a time, mm -hmm. or who've been playing this game for, you know, ten, fifteen plus years sometimes. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's still very much a part-time thing. Mm -hmm. Like we have games probably three weeks out of four in the summer a lot of the time. Um, but most players don't make it to all of the games because mm -hmm. people have real life mm -hmm. that they have. Isn't to do. there isn't there national tournaments and things that go on with this? I I, I remember. Oh yeah, there, the there's huge. Uh, there's a really big tournament out in Ohio um, that. Uh, we don't aren't usually able to send enough roosters guys to have to have the roosters team out there, but there's a, a Minnesota Union Club where uh, guys from all of the teams uh, in Minnesota will get together and go out there and play. Um, there is a a new um, tournament that started up in uh, I want to say it's Eau Claire, but it's not. Um, in Western Wisconsin anyway, mm -hmm. um, that we are attending. Um, so there, there is quite a lot because it's just like any sort of reenactment hobby where you're always looking for more people to get to bring in to make up numbers and make sure that you have enough people to get mm -hmm. games together and make a meaningful presentation. Um, that, that naturally brings people who are involved in the hobby together. You, you know, you mm -hmm. want to. And it's, it's interesting you said that hobby because that's really what baseball was back right. in, 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 for real, back in these days. I mean, it was not, this was not something like today where guys were getting paid. I mean, the first paid ball players weren't until 1869, 70, although there was rumors that guys were getting paid here or there to, to play be, before that. But, uh, you know, the first real professional team wasn't until, what 1869 with the uh, yeah. Cincinnati team and, the and so yeah. so then you know take what you just said right uh, about a lot of its hobby and you had 1869 how many what did they win uh, was it 67 70 some games in a row over like two seasons where so you had a guy you had a bunch of guys who were very good at what they did they were getting paid for doing it and they traveled across the country basically on a big old barnstorming tour from yeah. Boston to San Francisco and they won 70 ish games in a row over the course of a season because they were professionals playing against probably guys like you who were doing it for fun on the weekends right. or whatever, right? So you imagine that? What if, what if there was a team today of uh, professionals who stampeded across the country playing against... Uh... Right, if uh, <laughs> somebody got together, Aaron Judge and yeah, uh, right. you know, Mike Trout and like, you know... That's basically every... what they were. <laughs> yeah. That's what they were. Um, they they were the stars of the game at the time, right? I mean... Uh, right. Yep, yep. And it, it, it's funny that you bring up the amateur... Uh, 
a hobby sort of status is if you go back and you read the published 1860 uh, National Association rules, it was forbidden to take money to play. Mm -hmm. like you, you'd be banned from the National Association if, if somebody knew that you were getting paid to play mm -hmm. baseball because it was supposed to be just for the sport of it and for, you know, civic pride or, you know, it was mostly town teams and company teams and mm -hmm. things like that. And mm -hmm. it was supposed to be just an activity to bring people together and promote health and community and, and stuff like that. And I'm sure these guys wanted to win. I mean, they, oh, yeah. you know, they weren't out there just putting, you know, doing it for show. I'm sure that they did want to win, but it was not today where this was their livelihood. I mean, they went home and right. they, they did whatever they did after that. Many of them, matter of fact, some of the earlier, uh, early um, players were, uh, bankers and lawyers and <laughs> accountants and they were they were they weren't even the working class the game changed to the working class uh more as time went on but really it started out as a club sport for uh fairly affluent people in the beginning right. wasn't it? yeah people who had time to pl go play games in the evening that's exactly right there you go right i mean you you did not have time when you're uh when you're out working for a living and you're at you know the factory or you're on the farm I you going to go play baseball? What? <laughs> right. And that kind of ties into one of the big myths of baseball, too, is there's um, this kind of pastoral myth about baseball that, you know, it, it's, it's this. And it has something to do with that. It's played on a green field. And, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, it makes people think of this rural ideal. But it, it started in the cities. It started mm -hmm. in New York. And it started out east and then was really nationalized by the civil war where people from all over the country were coming together. And because when you're in the army, you have, you hurry up and wait a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. They needed time. They needed ways to pass time and also exercise and stay fit while they were passing time. And baseball was a good way to do that. Mm -hmm. um, one of the other great things about baseball is that you don't have to be a big person. You don't have to be tall. Uh, you don't have to be terribly fast, although it helps. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, people of all shapes and sizes and types can learn to play baseball as mm -hmm. long as you can, uh, you know, get down the timing to swing a bat and, and make connection with a ball. Mm -hmm. uh, you can figure out how to throw a ball reasonably close to another person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you can, uh, you can feel. Um, I'm with you. I, I to me, and, and believe me, I, I'm a sports fan. I, I love college football, and I, I, I there's, I, you know, I follow uh, every sport just about, right? But to me, baseball is the most uh, fair. Like you just said, you, th there's not any. I mean, yes, it helps to be physically uh, a specimen, yes. But does right. it necessarily mean you're going to be good? Not necessarily. You still have to have all of the other prerequisites, the, the hand-eye and, and the ability to, I mean, if you throw a ball, you know, 100 miles an hour, but you can't throw it over the plate, then it's not really uh, helping much. I mean, there, there's more to the game. And, and then the beauty of baseball is there's no time limit. I mean, right. really, I mean, <laughs> the game isn't over until it's over. And that that's, that's uh, uh, really, um, to me, uh, what makes it, to me, the, the the best sport going there's there's no uh, and, and what's going on today is a little you have that argument today of what's what's happening with uh, some of the rule changes that they've been implementing i do not like the seven inning you know for double headers and putting a runner on second base and all this kind of stuff but i i get it they're trying they're trying to uh, to do what they can to uh, uh you know keep things speed things along but i think there's other things that can be done that they're working on now <laughs> to try yeah. to, to try to get it back on, on even keel because you know, you, you know, just from this playing this game, there, there was no mound and there was a mound and they raised the mound and they lowered the mound. Then they pushed it from 45 feet back to 50 feet, back to 54 right. feet, back to the 60 feet that we have today. And, and so that 60 feet has been around for over a hundred years now. I mean, I think it was in the 1890s when they moved it back to 60 feet. So mm -hmm. this, this talk about moving it back, I mean, come on, for the last hundred and some odd years, it's been 60 feet, six inches. Uh, really? That's that's not the problem here. Uh, the, the goo on the ball <laughs> and lots of other things is, is what's causing what's going on. So um, anyway, the the uh, um, the league that you're 
in or the team that that you play with uh mm -hmm. how many games do you play a year you said three three a month sometimes or is it is there yeah. a, a schedule do you do you do is it like kind of a pickup game or is there how does that all work so the answer is yes and no <laughs> um so there isn't a league really um it's just kind of a loose association of all the clubs in the area and kind of the club captains will coordinate a schedule um you know our, our club captain will email all the other guys and be like hey um uh, you know we're looking for a game on this weekend do you guys have availability and it's all just kind of set up in between the clubs that are playing mm -hmm. um and there are guys who play on uh one club primarily but then help out with another club um, there are some kind of union um clubs where there are guys from who come from multiple teams when they have off weeks and, and get together and play on this other team too um like i said there's the minnesota union team and then there's um there's one called the mushrooms mm -hmm. if i remember correctly the mushrooms. they have wild maroon uniforms with these great mushroom logos on their shield uh and, you know, let, let's let's uh, just so everybody's clear here. You know, um, this was the way baseball began. Um, you have to take it for what it's worth. Everybody doing this is is having fun doing this. Yeah. So if if people enjoy, um, you know, getting out there on a weekend and having a little bit of fun, and it's a little bit of theater, and and you get together and you have a good time, and I imagine you have a beer or something after you're done, and you know. I think it's awesome. I, I really do. I, I, I got to see it, like I said, a long time ago, and and um, it, it kind of got me hooked. I, and, and then they never brought them back. They, I, I'm not sure if, uh, uh, you know, they, they had plans of trying to get it together down here, and it never it never happened. But um, maybe it's too hot. I mean, that's that's one thing about down here. Once, <laughs> once, once June starts to roll around down here in Texas, there's not, you know, going outside – um, there's a reason why they had the Astrodome and <laughs> why Minute Maid Park's a retractable roof. It, it's it's sure. rough. It's rough down here in the in the uh, in the uh, summertime. And and you know the other thing I was thinking about too with this. I mean, do kids go? Do kids go to watch this? Do they? Do they? I mean, or is it just just more an adult thing? So uh, at least our games are very much a family affair. Mm -hmm. So our our home field Schmidt Field is at the Olmst Olmstead County Historical Center. Um, it's on the grounds of the history center there. Uh, they have kind of uh, a 19th century farm set up. And then we have an open field where we play that has kind of a, a half outfield fence. Mm -hmm. um, there's usually a, a kind of crop field behind our, our right field. So that gets kind of interesting because that's <laughs> the uh, part of the outfield that doesn't have a wall. So uh, if anybody gets a, a really well-struck ball out there, there's uh, some kind of searching through the alfalfa or, or whatever <laughs> they have growing out there. That's um, awesome. And because there isn't any such thing as a home run in terms of that ball's over the fence, it's mm -hmm. gone mm -hmm. in, in our rules. Uh, <laughs> ball is always playable. So, uh, I mean, as long as it was fair. Mm -hmm. So no matter how far that's hit, you got to go and get it and get it back in play. And uh, that's not just because you need to try to get the guy who's running around the bases out. I mean, if it's out of our, our field, they're probably going to make it around, mm -hmm. but <laughs> there's a, um, there's a good point that you just said that everything is in play. You got to go get it. Right. <clears throat> yeah. People are talking about, the uh, so, I, so I think the goo on the ball is it this, this the way balls are the spin on balls today is your pitchers have the advantage. But the other thing was look at what stadiums were not that long ago. Most yeah. of them were either some kind of goofy proportions or you know I think the polo grounds was 500 and some odd feet to dead center. Uh, <laughs> you were not hitting home runs in some of these stadiums. It was a, that's what made it a different game. Today stadiums are a little bit more. Uh, uh, maybe hitter friendly and then you get bigger, stronger guys hitting uh, a ball who's, you know, coming in faster, the exit, you know, in, in reverse <laughs> is going to have a lot more uh, velocity to it. So that's why there's more home runs, but then why there's more strikeouts. And, and so it, it's kind of, uh, you know, maybe we need to adjust the stadiums and uh, uh, get, get a little bit more, um, you know, 
I, I guess I, they want to pack as many fans in there as they can. But, right. <laughs> you know, but like you're saying, these games, there's no fence. You just go get it. <laughs> right. And, it, yeah, there were home runs, but there was no such thing as a home run trot. You had to get your butt around the bases because <laughs> that ball's coming back. Yeah, it, And it, it's not just because it's playable, but a game was played with one ball yeah. usually. So uh, back in the day, the home, field, the home team would provide the ball. And uh, oftentimes the team that won would keep the ball. Now, uh, our organizer, a guy named Corky Gaskell, who uh, kind of runs the show for us as our, our fearless leader and organizes our schedule. And he'll umpire games a lot of times when he's not uh, captaining for us. Mm -hmm. But he makes a lot of our baseballs. Makes them? Wow. He makes them, yeah. So he, uh, he'll uh, wind a uh, string around a, a rubber center and um, crazy. <laughs> and then, you know, sew up that sort of lemon peel uh, leather exterior out of it. And so um, we do have some, there are a lot of manufacturers that you can buy balls from, but um, our organizer and a lot of other people home make their balls. So amazing. Um, yeah, I imagine the that... ones that are kind of expensive and uh, the homemade ones take a bit of time to make. So they're, they're kind of valuable. We don't want to lose them if mm -hmm. we can. How far? And, and it was very much that way back in the 1860s also. I, I, I've had, it, it was that way for a long, long time. Into the 1900s, they used to use the same ball. And that's why when, when pitchers uh, went from being from pitching underhand, because that was the way it was, to that kind of yeah. three-quarter to uh, over the top, um, then they started putting all manner of whatever on the ball. That ball, by the by the time it got you know halfway through a game, I, I didn't even know if you could recognize it as a ball. But they still kept on using it. Uh, there was some lawsuit, wasn't there? I think in the 1912 or something. I can't remember where the, the fan won the right to be able to keep a foul ball. <laughs> something weird. Yeah, like that. Um, <laughs> it might have been in 1908. It was, there, it was, there's this there's this great book called Crazy 08. There's all kinds of stuff that happened in 1908. I have that book, yes. Um, and they talk about it in that book, and I can't remember if it happened that year. It's right but around yeah, that there, time, yeah. There there was a kid who caught caught a foul ball and mm -hmm. wanted to keep it, and they the owners sent the cops up into the stand to take <laughs> the ball away from this kid, That's and, right. and they sued sued the team that did that, and. Um, you know, the judge said, no, you got to let fans keep the ball. And so that was the, the beginning of uh, the purse strings opening it a, a little bit, at least as far as baseball spending went. Yeah. But, you know, it was partly partly economics, partly um, the subterfuge, um, you know, sword and shield sort of competition between batters and pitchers mm -hmm. um, trying to be deceptive and make a ball hard to see. Uh, when you start up, start off with 1860s baseball and uh, up through the 1870s, uh, the rules emphasized a hittable pitch. Mm -hmm. um, people would naturally try and stretch that definition as much as possible because the like you batters said- call the pitches, right? A high or low and, and that sort of thing, is that? Is in, that right? uh, in 1871, they codified being able to ask for a high or low pitch, um, but it was kind of supposed to be sort of congenial, like, you know, give that person a, a fair chance to, to hit the ball and put it in play. And then Imagine what that. happens happens. Mm -hmm. um, but then to the same extent, that's where um, calling balls and strikes came into play. Also um, mm -hmm. there wasn't an automatic strike call in 1860. Um, the, the umpire could call strikes on you if they felt that the batter was sitting on good pitches. Mm -hmm. So if, if they thought if the umpire thinks you're being too picky, they can call you for sitting on that. Otherwise, there's no such thing as a called strike. Uh, mm -hmm. It's swinging or tipping it off or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and then the counts when they started to actually have counts. I mean, in the beginning, it was um, I, I don't know. It might have been as many as nine balls and <laughs> seven strikes or something. It right. took many many years and iterations before they finally got it down to today's four balls and three strikes. It took a long, long time. And then there were times uh, over the scoring of games. That's why, that's why baseball 
it is so maddening sometimes because you know you, you try to compare eras you can't they weren't playing by the same rules they weren't using the same equipment if they were using equipment at all i mean uh, you 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 can't you have to take it for what it was and and that's right. been that's been what i i was trying i've been trying to emphasize with the Negro Leagues with barnstorming and, and the history of that game because you cannot take what they were doing and try to just put it into a nice 19 or 2021 box. You can't, you can't do it. You, and it's the same way with early baseball history. It, 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 it is what it is for that time period. Enjoy it, you know, <laughs> and yeah. you could argue all you want whether uh, this guy was better than that guy, but you know what? You're never going to know. Right. It, 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 it is what it is. So, <laughs> Yeah. yeah, you can't, the, the frustrating and also kind of amazing and great thing about uh, Negro Leagues and, and other um, other forms of baseball that are set aside from Major League Baseball at whatever time you're looking at is uh, you they're not directly comparable, like you were saying. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the the Negro National League and the Negro American League, even in their height, those teams weren't playing uniform schedules. They mm -hmm. weren't playing strictly just each other mm -hmm. um, because the economics meant they had to do more. That's right. Um, they had to barnstorm. That's how they made money. That's right. Right. That's right. Uh, they played nearly year round. They, you know, they'd play their normal schedule in the summer, you know, out East and in the Midwest, and then they'd go out, you know, down south or out to California or somewhere in the winter, um, mm -hmm. you know, maybe Mexico or Puerto Rico mm -hmm. or Cuba mm -hmm. and and play games where it was warm because mm -hmm. they needed to make money. <laughs> That's right. And early baseball was much like that. It really wasn't much different. There was a lot of games being played that were not, you know, quote unquote league games. And and, right. and the, the early schedule, and I, I could put it up a little, in a little bit, but, you know, 1871, they, I think they played, um, you know, 30 35 games and 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 that was about it and, and a lot of that had to do with travel i mean you, you sure. could not get from one place to the other very easily if you're going from chicago to philadelphia or wherever you were going right. um it, it it was not like today where you could be there uh in a few hours on a, on a flight um it was a lot more planning um, and then over the course of history when you throw in things like um you know, the Civil War and World War One and, and, and the pens, you know, the pandemic of, you know, 1920 and World War Two. It, it changes all of that equation because now things are prioritized differently uh, as far as uh, who's playing what, when and where and why kind of thing. So, yeah. you know, I think people need to enjoy it for what it was. Uh, it's fun to argue and talk about whether Ed Delahanty was a better player than, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, whoever pick pick somebody right i mean uh, right. uh but it 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 really um it's not it's apples and oranges you can't you can't really do it so right um, like what would uh you know what would home run baker do if yes. he was live today no. and had you know access to modern uh baseball bats and it's funny you said that because that that 1858 league that i have out of the park i took a 154 game schedule standardized from 1858 all the way through, right? So there's going to be no, you know, 30 game schedules kind of thing. And then I took the um, neutralized statistics, meaning it's roughly maybe like a 1972, 74 to about 1990 uh, baseline for, for mm -hmm. statistics. Because that's about the midpoint of, of baseball between the dead ball and the pitcher errors and so forth, right? Yeah. And and that's where it fluctuates between for the whole course of history. And so home run Baker is hitting 38, 40 home runs um, based on his – uh, ability of what he hit in 1912 and you know those er those years right equated into a modern setting yes he is hitting more home runs <laughs> so you know Ty Cobb is hitting uh, you know winning triple crowns back in uh, you know 1910 11 that era 1908 uh, with eight home runs right <laughs> Well, that's right. that's 25, 30 home runs uh, if you were uh, putting it into a modern uh, setting, theoretically, right? I mean, it's, right. it's, it's and, just... And a... you can make arguments about um, that probably great athletes would be able to adapt to different eras. Um, I, and I, you do I, see that a little bit with Cobb, where he came up very much in the dead ball era. Mm -hmm. 
Um, you know, it came up in uh, in the late 19 aughts and uh, and played through the early 20s. And uh, you know, at the very end of his career was the modern the modern mm -hmm. baseball era, and he was still a good baseball player when he hung up his cleats. Mm -hmm. you know, he wasn't what he was in you know 1910 or whatever. Mm -hmm. He was still he was making adjustments. You mm -hmm. know, he he was just aging out. He couldn't keep doing that. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, if I, he'd uh, come up maybe five years later. I think you'd see a big difference in his stats where there'd be a lot more home runs mm -hmm. just because he would have been able to play a few years longer. And like you mentioned about the ball, right? I mean, that was not only did Ruth revolutionize the game because he was trying to hit home runs, but right. it was coming into an era of manufactured baseballs. Now they were wound tighter. Uh, he was trying to hit home runs and, and that's why he was hitting 59 <laughs> When whole entire teams, but when the whole entire teams weren't hitting fifty nine home runs, I mean, he literally out hit entire teams, yeah. and and it wasn't, I mean, he was a great player, but no one else was trying. And then when they started to, you saw more guys start to hit uh, into the twenties, into the thirties, mm -hmm. and then along came Jimmy Fox, and those guys were hitting as many as he was, right, Jim, Lou yeah. Gehrig and so forth. But uh, you know, he uh, came along. It's like anything, right? If you are on the cutting edge of something. Um, you become, the, you, he was groundbreaking. He, he changed the game himself, single-handedly, one man. So, you know, I, I'm not a Yankee fan, but to me, I mean, the greatest impact on the game of baseball, there's no question, it was it was sure. Babe Ruth. I mean, he revolutionized yeah. the game. He did things that no one else was doing. So, But it would be fun to go back and see if Ed Delahanty could hit 35 home runs. I mean, it would be kind of fun to right. see that kind of stuff. Yeah, you know. Would would Babe Ruth hit modern pitching? You know, I, I think that he That's probably a, would. Oh, I think he would. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> you know, one of the things that really drives me crazy is uh, a lot of people say, "Oh, well, you know, they weren't throwing 100 miles per hour back in whatever year." You don't know that they weren't. Mm -hmm. There wasn't somebody out there with a radar gun in in 1921. Well. You know, you got to um, take some of that with a grain of salt too, right? Because, yeah. you know, the reason why everybody's thrown 100 now is because they're measuring it differently than they were just a few years ago uh, sure. as far as, you know, at release point and, and it's different than it was. So everybody's picked up four to six miles an hour. Although, I, did you read this the other day? It was interesting. Um, there's been how many no-hitters so far? Eight? How many? I guess something like that, right? And And did you read that the velocity of the pitchers – um, who th have thrown all these no-hitters uh, is like average 92 or something. <laughs> so the guys throwing the no-hitters are not the ones that are throwing 100, right. despite the fact that that's been all of the talk, that uh, everybody um, you know, is throwing 100 miles an hour. It doesn't necessarily mean uh, they're, they're dominating. Um, you know, oh boy, talk, okay, so how many guys are on, on, this, on a vintage baseball team? I'm going to guess 10, 12. So it varies quite a bit. Um, it's usually going to be around that number, uh, you know, bare minimum. If, if we can just get nine, sometimes okay. that's what we'll play with. But you know, um, that was yeah. real. That was real baseball back then. They didn't carry twenty-five man rosters. No, they had ten, twelve guys if they were lucky. For right. a lot of for a lot of reasons, because once they started paying them, they didn't want to, have to. You know, the more guys on the roster, the more guys you have to pay, and that is the number one reason why there's 25 guys on the roster, <laughs> is is that the players association wanted more guys, keep adding more and more and more and more, uh, because more guys are getting paid now, right? I mean, that's that's bottom line. People want to get paid, but back in the days, there was not that many, and so back in those days, everybody played everywhere. Uh, if you weren't pitching maybe you played center field or shortstop or you know everybody played different positions where do you play when you're out there so uh you kind of hit the nail on the head there by saying that you really have to play a little bit of everything mm -hmm. and uh, you know we don't have a set uh a set roster um in that you know nobody is playing first base for the game um Pitching is a little bit different, um, even though it's kind of soft tossed underhand, uh, not everybody's real great at it. So we usually only have two <laughs> or three guys that pitch uh, and they don't pitch, you know, three innings at a clip or whatever. Mm -hmm. We kind of rotate them through usually. Mm -hmm. um, 
that's just our club. Some clubs do have a guy who will go out and pitch the whole game or most of the game. Uh, <laughs> but we really rotate through, uh, you know, if we have more than nine guys show up, um, you know, we'll bat through the order with 12 guys and we'll keep that batting order. But, uh, you know, we'll rotate people through a whole bunch of different positions. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, if there's more than nine guys, you'll, you'll sit one or two innings just to uh, get a break Mm -hmm. and also give people, uh, chances to play other positions. I play catcher a lot. Um, partly because I'm one of the younger guys and it's a little easier on my back and knees and stuff than some, some of the other guys. No, um, but no mask, no chest protector, nothing oh back yeah. there. Right. So yeah, you, no, you, no protection you, at all. You take, uh, you take any foul tips to your face. <laughs> I would I, imagine. I have not. Um, I haven't, uh, haven't had any injuries at all yet. That's um, good. And, um, I just remember one of the reasons that I play catcher is, uh, I'm actually kind of a terrible fielder. <laughs> but, I, <laughs> but I'm really good behind the plate. Um, it it, uh, it kind of annoys our opponents sometimes because, that, because I'm really good at catching uh, a, a backwards foul tip. Okay. So uh, I, I usually average uh, somewhere between one and three put outs that way a game. And what's that go down as a, a put out to the, for the, uh, is that a strikeout or what, what, what do they score that thing? If, if it's a, a foul tip backwards and you catch it on one bounce. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. If you catch it in the air or you catch it on one bounce, that's uh that's an out. So, and um, so you it's scored like any other foul ball. Um, awesome. I guess it would be, uh, you, know, you know, you know what I find funny. Um, I've had so many crazy conversations over the years with people. I, I got into, um, I, I guess I told you, I've been in, into baseball, baseball history for a long time. I worked in minor league baseball uh, with the scranton Wilkes-Barre Red Barons back in the 80s when they first Very became cool. a team, right? And so I was with them for about six, seven years. And mm-hmm. uh, during the games, I did the scoreboard and message board in the outfield and we were in the PA booth and we had a, an organist. It was a blast. I, I mean, I actually, to get paid for that, it was just, you know, it was too much fun. But we did have a... Um, benefit night for the Negro Leagues in 1992 and I didn't know anything about that history at all and it was when I, yeah. I I just you know got to actually meet some of these players who were still around at the time and it, it changed my whole perspective on a lot of things and and really got me interested in finding out more about it but one of the things I find funny is we're talking about the rules of the game back in 18 you know 60s to 1880s 90s it was how different it was mm-hmm. Old Hoss Radburn, what did he throw, 500 innings? I don't know, 600 innings? I can't remember <laughs> what he threw like back in those days, right? That's in the record book is the most, um, you know, uh, innings in a, in a season or whatever it is. Or he, yeah. won, he won 50 games, right? But, right. you know, that was when they only had one pitcher. <laughs> and they right. and, and he wasn't throwing, uh, you know, he was out there every single game. And I imagine over time, you know, it had to be a little bit of a strain on your arm to throw uh, inning after inning. But they'll, they'll be okay with those statistics. But Negro League statistics? Oh, no. No, you can't. No, you can't have Negro League statistics compared with Major League statistics. Right. Really? Really? I mean, what what is your argument there? I, I I'm not exactly sure what what point they're trying to make, other than uh, a pointless point. They just don't want to count them. Um. <laughs> I think it will start to change since they since they've recognized you know certain leagues over certain years as being major leagues now. Mm-hmm. Um, but they have to puzzle through what they're going to decide is acceptable and comb through and tabulate, you know, these are the official, uh, you know, official statistics uh, that count as major league statistics. Mm -hmm. Um, And I don't think uh, the unfortunate thing is I don't think anybody's going to ever be totally happy with that because some things will be kosher and some things won't. And, you know, that that's always going to be a losing job. (laughs) Mm-hmm. You're always going to disappoint somebody when you have to decide that something's in and something's out. Yeah. Um, but I do think that they are going to move towards recognizing more of that. I think it's moving in the right direction. Because mm-hmm. uh, like you were saying, I mean, if, if you're going to uh, count 1880s and 1890s major league statistics uh, against the modern era, if you're going to count the federal league, which mm-hmm. as a baseball history fan, 
I love the Federal League. Mm-hmm. But if you're going to tell me that that's mm-hmm. on par with the American League and the National League at the same era, mm-hmm. it's not really. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you look at the statistics, if you look at um, what the numbers that the players were putting up against washed up major leaguers and mm-hmm. what would you could generously call triple a quadruple a guys mm-hmm. um it's not the same it's no. not equivalent to what the american league and national league were doing but we count it as a major league mm-hmm. and, and the know, union association is kind of the same way mm-hmm. um so I, I think that they will figure out a way to quantify it in official statistics but it's probably going to take a while mm-hmm. Um, Because there's a lot to comb through, and there's always more information that's coming to light. Um, That's one of the frustrating things for anybody who wants to do any kind of um, pre-World War II, really, uh, baseball research, is that records are really uneven, and they can be really Mm -hmm. uh, scarce sometimes. Mm -hmm. And even if you do find records, you know, they, they, they might not be, they're often incomplete you know mm-hmm. you might get a, a winning pitcher and a loser losing pitcher and the the total or, mm-hmm. um, and you might get a full-on complete box score um, mm-hmm. one of the things that you just said is absolutely you know to me i i am i'm with you the the um if you're going to count some of these other leagues um baseball to me is the ultimate zero-sum game if you are in the majors, it means someone else is not. Right. So if you're going to have an argument or a, a discussion about whether Negro League players were major league caliber and, and they are agree that many were, that meant that there were already players in Major League Baseball who were not major league caliber, right? I mean, if, Absolutely. and so they would be triple A and then triple A, some of those guys would sip down to double A and eventually some of those guys would be out of baseball because it's zero sum here. There's only so many spots on a roster and if they're being replaced by somebody, those other guys are off. So the same argument saying that Negro League statistics are not, <clears throat> you can't count them all. Well, okay. How much percent of Major League statistics are we not going to count then? Because there right. were there were triple A or like you said four A guys who were up there playing. I mean, at some point you have to just draw the line and say, look, they are. Let's let's uh, let's come up with the best way to make it, uh, uh, you know, fair for everybody. And, and right. anyway, I, I think people forget that that it's, it is zero yeah. sum. That there were a lot of players in Major League Baseball that were not Major League caliber players. So it is what it is. You know if. If someone was paying me to make the decision, I guess where I would draw the line is um, league games. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, if you've decided that Mm -hmm. X year to X year of this league is a major league, those are major league seasons. Mm -hmm. Just tabulate all all the data you can find from the league games. Even Mm -hmm. though that's not all that those guys played, they played quite a bit more Mm -hmm. against quite variable competition if you're deciding that that league is a major league, judge the competition within that. Mm -hmm. And that's, and that is the plan. I mean, I, I, you know, people get a little nuts and they're like, Oh, but Josh Gibson's going to be 900 home runs. No, he's, he's not. He's going to have about 160 from what I've been reading. I mean, it's, it's really not that many. He might've across all of those, you know, exhibition games and everything. Sure. But some of those were against, you know, uh, a team in the middle of nowhere Mm -hmm. and, you know, Iowa or something mm-hmm. like, you know, that, that counted for the people that were there for sure. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> they put, but, uh, people paid money to go see it. I can tell you yeah, that. That's for absolutely. sure. And, yeah. um, you know, there, there's value. And that's not to say there isn't value in looking at, um, at barnstorming games mm-hmm. and, and that history. I think that, um, the more we uncover of that, the more mm-hmm. we find to, enjoy and admire um, mm-hmm. i know there's a guy who's doing a, a big project on uh, john donaldson yes p gordon kind of, yes mm-hmm. uh, yeah kind of the uh, somewhat forgotten uh, great negro league players who didn't really play that much in the negro leagues he mostly played as a barnstorming player because mm-hmm. uh, in amateur lot. baseball the color line wasn't really a thing i mean mm-hmm. it, it depended on where he lived partly like mm-hmm. you know, if you were in the in the south 
it probably was pretty much a thing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we had all kinds of black baseball stars come and play on town teams and industrial teams up in Minnesota for mm -hmm. many years. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah because yeah. they were willing to pay them. They didn't care. They mm -hmm. just, this guy's a, a great ringer. He'll come in and win games for us. That's right. <laughs> and besides that, it'll bring spectators in because they're, you know, it's, that... it's a, ba uh, a, a black baseball player in, you know, uh, Virginia, Minnesota, small, small mining town in Northern Minnesota, where there isn't exactly a lot of diversity in the early mm -hmm. 20th century mm -hmm. or even now, really, but especially <laughs> back then. <laughs> um, the, it's interesting, right? Because that's a point you just said about playing all over the place, I think is underappreciated about the Negro Leagues because they brought baseball to every small town that you can think of from Maine yeah. to Oregon and everywhere in between that it was a good brand of baseball. People paid money. If people yeah. are paying money, you know, think about this, right? Especially when you go back to the turn of the century, 1900, 1920, through the depression, money I mean, if you're going to part with your money, it better be something that you think is worthwhile, right? So if people were paying money to go see these Negro League players play, there had to be a reason why, right? And so they brought the they brought baseball to every small town in America. Uh, the major leagues were not. I mean, they were, you know, doing some barnstorming after the season was over and, and whatnot. Right. But, but really, um, where the brand of baseball was spread to become really America's pastime New York League's had a big hand in that and I think a lot of people sure. don't really um, um, you know look at that as part of what they were doing but it was they, they brought baseball yeah. everywhere <laughs> so so what else you got going on you're you're uh, you, you're a hat collector and you got oh, yeah. a, you got you're involved in a podcast what else you got going on so uh, I, I am a bit of a hat guy uh, I'm wearing my um, Ebbets Field Flannels, uh, 1915 <laughs> Newark Peppers cap. Newark uh, Peppers, they, wow. Yeah, from, uh, mentioned the Federal League before. They were a member of the Federal League. Uh, not one of the better teams, but uh, <laughs> I really like this cap. Uh, cool, it's, yeah. a, uh, it's a short brim cap mm -hmm. and uh, all soft construction. Mm -hmm. So I, I really like that mm -hmm. about it. Um, but uh, so I got... I grew up as a baseball fan and then I kind of drifted away from it in my uh, early to mid twenties. And then when I moved to Rochester, Minnesota in 2015, um, they have a summer collegiate league team there uh, called the Rochester Hawkers. And somebody turned me on to that and I started going to games in 2016 and baseball was close and familiar and cheap and mm -hmm. fun to go to again mm -hmm. and that got me interested in uh minor and lower level leagues of all sorts and and got me collecting hats um being a history buff i, I got into ebbets field flannels pretty quick because of the you know the historical recreations mm -hmm. and uh their you know, the little blurbs they do about their hats and jerseys and things got me learning more about teams and leagues I'd never heard of and kind of opening up this whole wide world of baseball that I, I had never been aware of, even mm -hmm. though I, you know, I followed the major leagues when I was a kid, I was kind of vaguely aware of the Negro leagues in that, like I knew Jackie Robinson had played there and I knew about Satchel Paige, but beyond that, I mm -hmm. didn't really know much about them. Um, so hats were kind of very tied into the history interest at first. And then when I got more interested in um, minor league and summer collegiate ball, I mean, there's so many cool hat designs mm -hmm. <laughs> that they make now. And I'm very much a collector by habit. Uh, you know, you can see behind me, I'm a, I'm a book collector mm -hmm. and, a, and a, uh, a reader too, but very much a book collector. And How many hats uh, you got? Um probably around 70 or so i mean it's not a huge collection i gotta get the it, dad hat. Ask my wife. i gotta get the she, dad hat guy on the dad hat chronicles on here he has uh, a, a quite a collection of uh, of hats that he he's always putting on i'd like to get him on here oh, and yeah. talk about baseball hats that'd be kind of fun yeah kind of fun I I know, have, i'm actually but... gonna have somebody on from uh, uh Ebbets field um probably beginning of july Nice. So we'll talk about a little bit about the company and, and what they got going on. So it'll be fun. Right. 
And uh, so the other thing that I got in, into because of my re-emerging interest in baseball is uh, I'm a big podcast listener. Um, mm-hmm. I used to work overnights, and so I had a lot of time to listen to things to keep me awake. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, now I commute quite a bit, so I listen to a lot of podcasts. And uh, was looking around for um, minor league podcasts because that was what I was really getting into, and there weren't a lot of them, at least not um, you know, five, six years ago. Um, but one of the ones I stumbled upon a few years ago was a podcast called let's get Two. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I'm going to, uh, put that up. Go ahead. Keep going. I'm going to, I have, um, I have the links you sent me, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put up their page, but sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, so let's get Two is, um, the tagline is baseball from the fans perspective. And it's very much about the cultural aspects of baseball. Um, We look a lot at mostly lower level, uh, minor leagues, independent leagues, Mm -hmm. summer collegiate. Uh, We do talk some about major league baseball because, you know, that's kind of everybody's, uh, if you're a baseball fan, you're a major league baseball fan, even if you're fans of other kinds of baseball too. Mm -hmm. Um, And we try to uh, highlight what, these lower levels of baseball are doing for fun and community Mm -hmm. um, to grow the game of baseball and baseball fandom and everything. Um, That's a big part of what's missing. I think uh, today is that is, is the growth of baseball has kind of stagnated because from the lower levels down and, and it's become like a business for eight-year-olds. I mean, I, <laughs> I don't know what's going on there, but you know, when, when you have travel teams and you're, you're concerned about how your eight and under uh, is doing, I think you've lost perspective. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's gotta be fun. And uh, you know, fun is what drives interests and grows the game. Mm-hmm. And um, it's gotta be fun and it's gotta be inviting. Um, you know, we really think that baseball is for everyone uh, that, everyone can be a baseball fan that there are different ways to be a baseball fan Mm -hmm. and um so we really kind of focus a lot on that a lot on raising awareness of local baseball that's out there um and like you said as far as affordability goes can't beat it Um, oh yeah my my brother um lives in virginia beach and he goes down to um uh, Eastern North Carolina quite a bit. And he mm-hmm. stumbled upon a team a couple of weeks ago uh, called the Edenton Steamers. Have you ever heard of them? I haven't. You have not? <laughs> All no, right. They are, they are a summer league team, but they are in the hometown of uh, Catfish Hunter. Uh, and okay. so he, he sent me a picture a couple of weeks ago. He's driving over the Catfish Hunter Memorial Bridge in, in uh, nice. Edenton, North Carolina. It's where, where he was from that area. And so yeah. the stadium is named for him and, and the steamers play there. They're a co- summer collegiate league team. Mm-hmm. And so I'm going to have to suggest that as a hat that they're going to have to go get. He's going to send me some videos. So I'll, I'll try to post it on, uh, on my uh, Twitter from, uh, from the game, but it's a cute little stadium. Nice. I mean, it, it, see, it only seats maybe like a thousand people and, and, uh, you know how it is, right? You know, their their nights, um, their giveaway or, or their their fan appreciation nights are like, you know, wear your Boy Scout uniform and get in at you know half price or you know that right. kind of stuff. And but that's what was fun about the game of baseball back in the mm-hmm. day. And and it's kind of uh, uh, if you want to get kids back interested in it, you've got to get them from that age. Uh, otherwise right. um, they become lifelong fans after that. Like probably like you and I did. You know? Right. And one of the other things that we really like to talk about on let's get to is that if you look at baseball at any given level, um, organized competitive baseball tends to be fairly, um, I mean, I already said competitive, but it, it tends to be fairly competitive and it, it looks like a baseball game. You mm-hmm. know, it, when you go out and see a Northwoods League game, a, a summer collegiate league game, um, there's going to be a little bit of a variation of quality in that these are our college kids and mm-hmm. they are still, they're learning with a wood bat and everything. Mm-hmm. Um, but 
it's going to look like good competitive baseball. Mm-hmm. It's not like when you, you know, there's the XFL or the AAF mm-hmm. or one of these kind of off brand football leagues that starts up mm-hmm. and don't get me wrong. I love those, <laughs> but it doesn't look like the NFL, mm-hmm. even when they're light quality teams playing each other mm-hmm. with baseball. When you have light quality teams playing each other, it looks like good competitive baseball, mm-hmm. uh, regardless of what level you're at. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's one of the things we really like to highlight in that, you know, even it, some people get kind of sanctimonious about real baseball. Mm-hmm. It, it's all real baseball. If you're out at a summer collegiate league team, if you're out at an independent league team game, um, you're going to see two teams of like quality and it's going to look like real baseball. Mm-hmm. And if you go out to a summer collegiate league game or a, a minor league game or an independent league game you get to sit close those players interact with fans Mm -hmm. that's exactly Uh, right they're encouraged to Mm -hmm. especially with the the summer collegiate leagues you know they're they're members of the community um you guys would love this you guys would love the steamers hat it's a it's a clam it's a steamer is a um you know, like a, it's a little, little, two little eyes looking out of a clamshell. It's, it's really cute. Nice. You, you probably would like it. Love it. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I'm with you, man. You got some good stuff on here. I, I really like. Uh, I encourage anybody, you know, to start checking out some of these things because this is some, uh, some cool stuff you guys got on here. Yeah. Yeah. So we're all about raising awareness about local baseball. We're all about positivity and inclusiveness and, and boosting people that we think are doing good, positive things in baseball. Mm-hmm. So if, uh, if that's the kind of thing that appeals to you, definitely check out Let's Get To. We do a, uh, a weekly podcast and also a YouTube feed. Mm-hmm. So there's a, a video or audio component. If you're like me and you have an hour commute both ways each day, yeah. Uh, Podcasts real good. They if are. you have time to, to watch the uh, the YouTube video, sometimes our segments translate a little bit better better in video. Um, we we do a segment called "Show Me the Merch" where we talk about like hats um, from various teams that we visit or or buy merch from. Uh, I do a segment called "Raiders of the Lost Diamond," where I dig up the history of a defunct baseball team. Cool. And it's usually a minor league team or independent league team. Uh, we did recently do even a, uh, a summer collegiate league team, a, a defunct Northwoods league team. But uh, we dig up uh, either a, a funny name or, uh, you know, a, a cameo by a famous person that played in You'll Never Guess Where, or, you know, the mm-hmm. crazy historical event that happened at a minor league game and build, uh, you know, a few minutes around that and kind mm-hmm. of uh, fun stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. A, a fun way to grow people's awareness of, of baseball that's happened outside of New York or LA mm-hmm. or St. Louis or someplace like that. Mm-hmm. No, I'm, I'm with you. I think it's great. I, I, uh, I highly recommend people go check it out because it's, it's some good stuff. Uh, what else you got going on? You, uh, uh, what do you got coming up in the near future? Oh, on I'm... that. What are you going to be talking about on there? So, um, my next episode is probably going to be about the California League. So we're kind of doing some retrospectives about some of the leagues that no longer exist since uh, the oh, minor yeah, yeah. Were, uh, yeah. were reorganized. We did one on the Texas League. And um, even though I've only been to one, <laughs> one game out there, um, the Cal League is kind of near and dear to me. My wife's from California. Mm-hmm. And... Um, when I got into um, kind of investigating and learning about uh, the minor leagues and minor league history, California uh, minor league baseball history is really uh, wild. It's its its own thing. Hmm. Um, but uh, <laughs> one, of the, one of the best um, baseball experiences that I've had is uh, a couple of years ago, I got to go out to a Stockton sports game. And for 12 bucks a seat, we sat directly behind home plate mm-hmm. in the first row. Can't beat uh, it. In, in a great little stadium. Mm-hmm. Um, but so I think that's going to be our next thing. Um, we're cool. doing a lot of travel segments. Um, I'm getting out and taking advantage of uh, the pandemic <sighs> doing a lot better and, and mm-hmm. doing some baseball travel. So uh, I met up with 
uh, James Christopher. He's the host of Let's Get To down in Cleburne, Texas recently. And we went to a Cleburne Railroaders game. Um, we're going to be meeting up for some Northwoods League games coming up later this month. Uh, going to be in Fond du Lac and Madison, Wisconsin, see the Doc Spiders and the Mallards. The Mallards. And we're going to be in Waterloo, Iowa to see the uh, Waterloo Bucks. Cool. Cool. Here's your, I'm going to put up, here's your um, Roosters uh, Facebook. Uh, I, I, I hope people check around and see what's in their area and give this this a look because it, it's it's a lot of fun this is the other link you sent me the vintage baseball uh association website yeah that um, has got the whole national um sort of perspective on all this and and it, it's just a lot of fun i i, I think uh, you know everybody should at least see a game um to put today's game in perspective as to what it was because um it, it's part of history if you you have to know your uh you have to know your history in order to be able to talk intelligently about <laughs> where Absolutely. you go where you're going right i mean <laughs> yeah it's kind it, of it, uh, it's and we focus on fun and uh, <clears throat> at least the club that i play with we also focus on education so mm -hmm. we'll usually do some explanation of the differences between the rules uh, between modern baseball mm -hmm. and what we're playing so that people understand why things look a little different, look a little weird. Um, but the, the th great thing about baseball is even though we're playing by 1860 rules and even though we're dressed up in these funny uniforms, it's still recognizable as baseball. Um, I'm gonna, uh... And if you enjoy that, you're going to have a good time. Even if you, you know, aren't a hardcore baseball follower, it's mm -hmm. going to be a good time. And, and, you know, if you're interested at all in that, look up a local team. We're always looking for people to come out and, mm -hmm. uh, and play in games or even help with uh, concessions and set up. Uh, you don't have to be a man. Um, we've had women on our team in the past that will dress up in, in our men's cool. uniforms. And we also have a women's team called the chicks or cool. the, the hens and the chicks. Uh, we two sides that play each other in 19th century dresses. Oh my um, God. That's funny. It, it's hard enough to, to play in, in the full get up that we wear. It's so impressive that those ladies <laughs> I bet. are able to do that in dresses. I have all the respect. For you. I bet. Well, you know, that was a, that was actually a pretty popular, the bloomer girls yeah. back in the 1880s through about the 19, I want to say twenties at least. I mean mm -hmm. that, uh, and, and they had some crazy, I mean, they had Rogers Hornsby and some of the stars of the game that used to play as a ringer on the bloom with the bloomer girls, which yeah. I, don't think, I don't think most people even would even believe that, that that would be true, but it was, I just want to just, just so you can get in a perspective of uh, you get to recognize these names. This is 1871 uh, in baseball, but I just love these names. Asa Brainard. Long Levi Meyerly, Ross Barnes, Lipman Pike. There's Al Spaulding. Nice. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Fergie Malone, Ezra Sutton. I mean, these were, there's Cap Anson down there. Uh, these were the, uh, this is the 1871 uh, season, which I, it would be the National Association right before mm -hmm. the National League started. So uh, yeah. just to see these names and, and these were, this is where the game began. Um, and so it's funny, right? Because just to put this in perspective, when you look at um, pitchers, there's only two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, thirteen guys who pitched in an entire league of nine teams. So it gives you an idea of uh, <laughs> one man is all you had for yeah. your entire. So in 1871, Asa Brainard pitched um, all 30 games, although the statistics are weird, right? He has 30 game starts, but only 27 decisions. So, you know, right. they, want, they want to talk about Negro League statistics. Um, yeah, real baseball wasn't exactly, um, you know, 100% accurate back in those days either. Right. <laughs> you know, Al Spaulding, this was, um, he was only 20 years old at this time, but um, 38 and 8 in 19. <laughs> In 1872, and 48 games start. 41 and 14 in 1873. So, 
you couldn't you couldn't do that today. I mean, you, you right. couldn't you couldn't do that a hundred years ago. This we're talking one hundred fifty years ago. But it is fun, and it it, it gives you perspective. Look at look at eighteen seventy four. Al Spalding fifty two and sixteen. <laughs> it just makes you laugh. Fifty five and five. Right. How's, how's that even possible? <laughs> Anyway, and uh, to keep in perspective, like these eight, eight, early eighteen seventies, these guys are still throwing underhand. They're still, yes, not, exactly. you know, throwing all out the way we're used to thinking of no, pitch going. But no, you do that for you know, seventy games, you're still gonna feel it. Yeah, you have a little bit of st- stamina. Six hundred innings. I mean, that's a that's kind of crazy because, like, you, you know, it, we were talking about earlier, these pitch counts. Um, they, 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 they're not the same. I mean, they were probably throwing two, three hundred pitches a game, and because they weren't throwing, you know, they're throwing basically three quarter underhand for most of these. It wasn't until I think maybe the right. 1870s, 1880s when they started getting away with letting pitchers throw um, almost overhand. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm not, I'm not 100 percent familiar with the uh, with the um, rules and and the way that they changed back in those days, but I know. Uh, somewhere around in there and then i, I want to say uh who was it bid mcphee was the last uh the last major league player in like the early 1890s that was the last one to play without a glove so think of that guy right <laughs> there's a guy he could have been using a glove for about the last five to ten years of his career he chose to not use a glove anyway i mean that's right. That's a I mean, tough that's the nut. thing is, <laughs> anytime there's been a big change in uh, baseball, it's usually a gradual change. Mm-hmm. Like we, People always like to think of history in terms of definite events, but it's usually a gradual change. Mm-hmm. And like with gloves, the early glove was, I mean, it was literally just a leather glove in the way that most people would like think a driving a like a driving glove yeah. yeah yeah it just it just covered your hand it mm-hmm. didn't really provide a lot of padding mm-hmm. um and the first guy that tried to do it got it had kind of a pink flesh colored glove because he was trying to hide that he was using one yeah um but a lot of the the players that were playing when the glove first started to show up uh thought that they wouldn't get as good of a grip with a glove mm-hmm even though it you know provided a little more protection a little more durability for your hands uh, but let me tell you if you go out and play catch play a game with uh you know barehanded uh you're gonna feel it mm-hmm. and you're gonna it's gonna rough up your hands you're gonna get some bruises and calluses and stuff um but you know quite a few of the players took some convincing that a glove would actually help them out mm-hmm. and uh you know i have uh <laughs> I have a uh, 19, probably 1940s Nakona glove. So it's uh, it's got split fingers. It just has webbing between the uh, the thumb and, and the uh, index finger. And so I like to practice with that um, to kind of toughen up my hands before vintage baseball starts because it's barely <laughs> got any padding. I bet. It's tough to catch a ball um, barehanded day in day out yeah that, that would right be. but it's amazing how much more even that kind of glove allows you than just barehanded mm-hmm. especially if you've got a solid ball um, <laughs> or if you've got a ball that's uh, a little more experienced let's say it's been used a bit they do soften up quite a bit and uh, a ball will even soften up over the course of a, of a vintage game too mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, if there's weather happening and it's, uh, it's wet and rainy, like they'll get so, waterlogged pretty significantly. Um, so who do you do? Who do you do the let's do, let's get to, who, who does that? Who else is on that podcast? So uh, that podcast is hosted by James Christopher. He, uh, he hosts that podcast and a movie podcast also. He's a uh, former movie maker. Okay. And, I'd I'd love to get you and and the dad hat and 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 him on here and talk some minor league baseball and maybe we'll get my brother to uh, uh, get get uh, on there from a steamer. You got to check out the Edenton Steamers. I'm telling you, they're Definitely. they're they're going to be the uh, they're going to be the, it, it, it's a awesome logo. I mean, it's cute. It's a little clam with a little eyeball sticking out. It's, it's cute. <laughs> so check it out. But I'm the, always on the lookout yeah, for another yeah, cool looking hat. Yeah. Um, there's a couple of teams down that way. They that play um, in that, that kind of uh, 
uh, they call it the inner banks of North Carolina, uh, sure. between Hatteras and, and heading inland towards like Raleigh Durham. It's a bunch of teams. I want to say six, eight teams that play in a in a collegiate league for the summer there. Um, yeah. Do yeah. You, so you know if if they're in the coastal plain league. Uh, you know, I don't know, but um, okay. I'll find out more. Yeah, I, I didn't, never even knew they were there until. Uh, okay. uh, but you know, it's kind of like um, uh, I, I have a friend of mine who um, he does. You know, either well, no, he doesn't work for them, but he knows somebody who works for the um, Cape Cod League, the, up in uh, New England, that yeah. has a number of teams that the same thing, collegiate baseball league for uh, guys coming right out of uh, high school or college. And yeah. and uh, a lot of a lot of I mean heck Aaron Judge played in that league and and Derek Jeter played in that league I mean there's some big names who've gone through the uh, Cape Cod sure. league so I would love to find out more about this uh, Carolina league because I bet you the same thing there's probably been names who have played through there that you go wow I never knew that <laughs> right and that's kind of one of the things that I like to really uh, highlight with um, with Raiders of the Lost Diamond is that. Uh, no matter where you're watching baseball, there's a chance that there's a future star or a mm-hmm. for, or sometimes a former star that that you could be seeing play. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're going out and seeing a summer collegiate league game, you know the the Northwoods League that we have up here in the in the Upper Midwest. There have been so many future major leaguers that have gone through there. Uh, Max Scherzer and Chris Sale and Pete Alonzo and. Uh, mm-hmm. Going further back, uh, Curtis Granderson, and Andre Ethier, and all kinds of, of major leaguers have come out of there. Um, They're in the it's the Tidewater Summer League. I just looked it up. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm gonna. <laughs> you have to. You got to see their logo. It's cute. I'm gonna throw it up here. But um, the Catfish Hunter, you you know, there's a fellow who has the Shoeless Joe Jackson Museum. Yeah. Um, there is a Catfish Hunter Museum similar. Uh, down in uh, Hertford, North Carolina, which is just oh, outside of, yes, and 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 it's the same kind of, th- you know, maybe a similar situation. I don't really know too much about the Shoeless Joe Jackson Museum, but look at it. there's the steamers logo. Look at it. There's a little clam with with eyeballs. <laughs> it's funny. Nice. Yeah, um, but yeah, there they are, Edenton Steamers, and and the, um, uh, but the Shoeless Joe Jackson Museum or the. Capish Hunter Museum is kind of the same thing. It's just a little place that he, a guy started collecting, uh, you know, catfish hunter memorabilia because here it is in uh, in Hertford, North Carolina. But this bridge right here, I don't know if you can see it on here, that comes across on 17 across from uh, the lower part of Virginia into North Carolina. Mm-hmm. That's the Catfish Hunter Memorial Bridge. It's been renamed. <laughs> So, yeah, so if you ever get over there, uh, check it out. I mean, there there are so many, uh, I'm sure, cool, cool places, and, and I'm glad you got to go see uh, some of them in your trip when you came down here. We're, Cleburne, I've never been over to Cleburne. I, I'm just north of uh, Houston in spring, so I probably okay. I couldn't have been too far. Is Cleburne up near Dallas? Is that where that was? Yeah, so it's, uh, it's kind of south-southwest of Fort Worth. Okay. So. All right, it's, I know. Uh, it's I just thought it was up that way. Yeah, so it wasn't too far from here. You ever come down this way? Let me know. We'll uh, we'll go have a beer and watch a, a minor league game. I'm I'm probably uh, I'm not too far from Round Rock and some of those places. So yeah, <laughs> that'd be kind of fun. This was great. What else you got on your mind? Anything else you got on your mind? This was this was good. I'm glad uh, we got you on here to do this. And like I said, we'll get you on here again, uh, maybe with. Uh, dad hat and <laughs> your compadre and let's get to yeah. and talk some minor league baseball because i think uh, uh, more people need to get back into the roots of that as well definitely thanks for having me philip and uh i'm always happy to uh meet up and talk baseball with other baseball enthusiasts yeah it's fun enthusiasts. Uh, it's fun yeah we didn't get Nothing into like uh, nerding out with another nerd. Absolutely, we we didn't get to talk. I, I, I you know one of these times I, I would talk to you about. Uh, I grew up the same way, uh, playing uh, all the Avalon Hill board games and everything else. I oh mean, yeah. my God, I still have. You know, it's funny. My my wife is always like, "You still carting that stuff around, right?" I have like you know boxes full of uh, board games from uh, the 1970s and some even older that uh, you know 
hey, look at this. And she's like, oh, that's cool. Okay, it goes back in the box, right? But it, it, <laughs> one of these days I want to do something with them. But, uh, you know, I, I, I know you, you talk a little bit about some of the uh, – different board games and things that you've been into over the years it's fun stuff i, I think definitely uh, and and uh i i do play a baseball sim called dead ball really um what yep it's a it's an all paper and dice based uh, okay. simulation so it, it's kind of similar a little bit to um if you're familiar with playing uh, a role-playing game and that you're using dice to make a check but that check is an at bat okay um so it, it's a really neat system in that as long as you can find uh, enough statistics, you can make a player or a team or whatever uh, that you can play with the system. And it's got pretty good fidelity and you can play a game cool. in a half hour to an hour. Mm -hmm. It plays solitaire really well because of the, um, because of the way the, the dice mechanic works. <laughs> um, what was you're, that? You're mostly uh... just making, uh, you know, pitching management kind of decisions and then letting the dice work it out. Um, but uh, what was that book that kind of started it all back in the seventies? I want to say uh, something about um, the something baseball universe. And it was a, a guy had created this whole world based on a, of a, a dice and card game that he had created. Well, I, I have the book too. I can't remember, but it, it kind of started the whole, uh, uh, you know, we're Stratomatic and Appa, and, and then yeah. some of those other games into the 80s. I, I even have uh, a couple of seasons of um, Pursue the Pennant and some of these games where uh, they just were fun. I mean, you know, uh, as a kid, that was – we didn't have – I didn't have computers. No computers. They didn't even exist. Right. Everything was your – I still have the writing callus on my on my finger from so many box scores. I was writing it by hand right. and everything, you know. Now I, now I, I forget how to write now because I type everything you know yeah. uh, back in I mean, those I, days that's what you did yeah and and board games are really kind of going under going through a renaissance right now and, and have been over the last probably 15 20 years mm -hmm. um, and especially with the pandemic and people needing to find mm -hmm. activities that they can do inside and do by themselves <laughs> or with the people in their household um, they're they're finding analog games again mm -hmm. um, and yeah, a, a lot of the stuff. baseball sims that there are analog versions of, there are computer versions of also. Mm -hmm. But um, for my money, it's it's always been easier to justify sitting down with something in front of me on mm -hmm. the table and spending time with that as opposed to spending time you know, clicking around doing something on the computer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, part of that's that, you know, I, like so many people, it work it, – work with computers. Only. Yeah. See what a break. Yeah. You're, mm -hmm. you're doing emails and all these other things for mm -hmm. work and you need, you need a break from some screen time and like dead yep. ball, the way it works out is your um, you're writing out a box score as you, as you get your game results. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of uh, cool. kind of cool in that way too. And <laughs> like, uh, boy, oh boy. I know some of the games like Stratomatic or, um, status pro or, or some of those other older games like they have an actual representation of the field on a board that you're mm -hmm. moving pieces around and stuff mm -hmm. um, but this is all and and you can do that with dead ball too but it's not required all you need is a piece of paper <sighs> and to, to write it out and have it in your head and uh it's, I don't know, it's, real it's, relaxing. it's funny how uh man i don't want to go down another rabbit hole but um a lot of uh videos i've been seeing recently of college and even high school games where the catchers are wearing earpieces mm -hmm. and now there's they're they're literally looking over and now they're talking to them and the pitchers have flip charts on their belt and right. flip charts yeah. on their wrist and it's like wait a minute you know when when I was a kid and I and I played through high school a little bit into college two years and and as a kid I remember growing up and playing um in my backyard with a rubber ball against the wall and my glove and literally in my head, I would go through all the pitch counts and calling balls and strikes and different situations. And, and it, it was, it, it, it's how you learn the game by playing it. Not someone yeah. telling you all the time. Sometimes you have to, you have to understand the game um, on your own. Otherwise <laughs> we're, 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 you know, at some point you're going to hit a situation and you don't know how to react to it. So I think that's part of what's, happening with so many younger kids i mean travel teams um 
not all the kids are getting to play all the time now. So, you know, sometimes right. you're paying. Parents are playing for now. Now it's pay to play. First off, then you're playing. You're paying and not always playing. And then when you are playing, it's like so mechanical. And 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 I, I know. Anyway, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. But <laughs> um, you know, just talking about these these board games and and how things in your mind sometimes it, it expands all sorts of things. It, it it's 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 good. I think. Maybe it's good if kids get back into some of this stuff. So, yeah. <laughs> All right, man. Well, good talking to you. This was fun. Um, I'll see if I can set something up for maybe in a couple of weeks, get you guys on here, and we'll talk some minor league baseball. Sounds good. All right, man. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Thanks for having me, Phil. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.